InLisp-D is a personal computing environment. Personal computing environments have a number of salient characteristics. Perhaps the most salient is the presence in the user's office of the machine itself, in this case a Xerox Dolphin research computer. These machines, typically about the size and color of a small office filing cabinet, tend to sit in one corner of the user's office and give off heat and noise. And for that reason, they're increasingly now mounted remotely, uh, not in the office of the person who's using them. Indeed, this particular machine is usually mounted remotely like that, except on occasions like this one where I want to have it photographed. To compensate for the very individualistic nature of everybody having a machine of their own, the machines are all linked together using some kind of communications network. In this case, we use the Xerox 3 megahertz research ether network. And using that ether network, I can reach out and access a number of facilities that there's clearly no reason I'd ever want to have in my office. Things like shared file servers, shared printers, and the consoles of my friends and colleagues. The consoles themselves are also distinctive. In addition to a fairly conventional keyboard, they have a high-resolution bitmap display, which allows the use of very flexible graphics in presenting information to the user. In addition to the display, they have a pointing device or a mouse, which by sensing horizontal motion on the table, allows one to point under software control at any object on the screen. The combination of these very flexible input and output devices and the steady supply of computing guaranteed by the dedicated computer allows a style of interaction which is quite different from what one is used to in a timeshare environment. It's much more reactive and it has a much higher bandwidth through to the user. And one of the key problems in personal computing has been to develop techniques which exploit this power. Techniques such as windowing, pop-up menus, browsers, graphic simulations, icons, are all different ways that people have tried to harness this power. As a result, when you look at a demonstration of a system like this, what one is most struck with is the techniques that are being used to communicate this information, the pictures that are being drawn on the screen. And for InterLisp D, at least, that's a very sad misperception. Because in addition to being a computer, personal computing environment, InterLisp D is also InterLisp. An InterLisp is a programming environment and language which has developed over the last 10 years on large time-shared machines like PDB-10s. During the course of this development, in addition to standard paraphernalia of a modern computing language, it's also developed a very extensive collection of programming tools. These tools and the size of the collection can be best judged by the size of the InterLisp manual that documents them have been proven to be very useful when people are trying to deal with very large programs that they're having a that are almost too large for them to understand and control. The kinds of tools that are provided are things like knowledge-based program analysis, automatic maintenance of databases about the files, programs, and where they belong, automatic error correction, and programmer's assistance. Now, the real challenge of Intellis D for us was therefore to marry this, this rich tradition that came out of the timeshare environment with the specification power and flexibility of the personal computer. And what we're going to show you in this demonstration is the current state of the marriage between these two different traditions. Unfortunately, since we'll be demonstrating a programming environment, we're going to have to choose a very small scale example in order to fit the example in in the time that would be reasonable to ask you to watch. That's unfortunate because the real value of these tools is generally in coping with very large problems. And to work through a large or a real problem in this time would simply not be feasible. On the other hand, we hope that, they'll, that the facilities we'll show you will give you a flavor for the kind of environment that's come from the marriage of these two different traditions and how the, they both contribute in their own way to simplifying the programming process. We're now looking at the screen of a dolphin running into Lisp D. During the course of this demonstration, we're going to take an existing program and modify it to do something slightly different. The program we have in mind is a program to edit arbitrary graphs and lattices. We don't have a program that's quite like that, but we have something fairly similar, a program for editing trees. This program was originally developed as part of some linguistics research at Park, and I was given this program and told to run it by typing in a sentence for it to parse. And running the edit tree program on the output of that parsing. When the parser was finished, a little bit further down to the right, the cursor exchanged to an expanding box image. This is the system's way of telling me that it's waiting for me to specify a region of the screen for it to use. I move over to the right to an area that's currently not in use, 
and I open up a window by pressing down on the mouse button and stretching out an expanding box until I have something of about the right size and shape. When I let go of the mouse button, that is turned into a window and the output of the edit tree program is put into that window. When I'm in the edit tree window, I can select an arbitrary node out of the tree by select, pointing the mouse at it and holding the mouse button down. While I'm holding it down, I can move the node. As you can see, the node is moved around on the screen and the lines are adjusted automatically for its new position. I can also hold down another button to bring up a pop-up menu. The pop-up menu has a series of commands that the tree editor knows about and by moving the mouse across the surface, I can select one of the commands to, for it to be executed. In this case, I can add a link and in this, it's now asking me to specify nodes that will be linked together. So I'll draw a node from a link from VP bar down to Pro. And you can see the node's been drawn in. This is fine and it's very nearly what I want. The only problem that it has is that if I pick up this VP node and I move it so that it's higher than the node that uh, the link is being drawn to it from is, then the link is going to be drawn still from the bottom of the source node to the top of the destination node, even though in this case the destination node is higher than the source node. Now that's not a problem for trees, but it's certainly a problem for graphs, and it produces this very annoying visual effect of the line being drawn through the label that uh, the node belongs to. So at this stage I want to start investigating how I can change this program around uh, to eliminate this undesirable feature. So I'll bring up the menu of commands and stop the editing and go back to the teletype window to begin exploring this particular system. The way I'll begin my exploration is to use the master scope program analysis system to show me the calling structure of this particular program. The calling structure is obtained from master scope by asking it to show paths from the program edit tree. Edit tree, remember, is the function that we call to begin this whole process. So that's the root of the calling structure. You'll find now that the cursor has changed into an expanding box and waiting f it's now waiting for me to prompt it uh, with, uh, now waiting for me to give it a window into which it can put the output of this analysis. So I'll specify a fairly broad and shallow window. It's the kind of calling structure I expect to see. And there indeed is the calling structure of this system starting with the edit tree function which is the, the root of the tree and proceeding down from there. Over to the left we can see it calls a function called edit lattice. Over to the left again a function called track cursor a function move node, display node, and down here in the bottom left hand corner is a function called display link which is almost certainly the function that I want to edit in order to make the change that I want. Just to be sure I'm going to look at that function by selecting it by pressing a mouse button down and when I do that it will prompt me once again for an expanding with an expanding box cursor asking me to specify a window into which it can put the output uh, the actual definition of that function for me to look at. I'm going to select a, another window this time overlapping some of the windows I have up already because I'm running a little bit short on screen space and the system is going to take that window to use and put the definition of display link in there. You'll notice that there was a slight pause then and the slight pause was giving it time to reach out across the Ethernet because it turned out that this particular function it did not have symbolic definitions from in the, in the system. It had to go to Phylum, which is a file server on, on the local Ethernet, to the directory list demo. In the file latticer, it found the definition of display link. In display link, we see it's a standard Lambda expression. It has a couple of comments in it, including one that stamps each function with the time and date it was last edited and the initials of the person who did the editing. And the actual only thing it does is it draws a line using the system uh, line drawing primitive between two locations, the from paths of one of its arguments and the to paths of another one of its arguments. If we now go back to the browser, we'll actually see that display link was, t we were told the display link called these two functions, just as we've seen when we actually look at its body. We'll actually have a look at these functions to see what they're doing. I'll button that one up. If we go back to the uh, other window, you'll see that after a moment's hesitation from the file server, 
uh, we see the definition of the from parse. It turns out to be nothing else other than a simple fetch of a field out of a record. If I button up to parse in the browser, we'll get a look at the definition of that. That also turns out to be nothing else other than a simple record fetch. There are a couple of problems with this code from my point of view. Firstly, this structuring is completely wrong. The from parse and the to parse are not functions of the node as they are written here, but they are functions of the relative positions of the two nodes between which the link is being drawn. So the first thing that I want to do in reshaping this uh, system to the new structure that I want is to go back to the teletype window at the top left and issue a command which will have uh, which will use the master scope program analysis system to make a systematic series of changes. The systematic series of changes that I want to have done is I want the system to edit where anybody calls these uh, these functions from pause and to pause. Actually I want to call it from pause or to pause. And wherever it finds one of those two functions, I want it to execute the editing command getD which will replace that call with an actual copy of the definition. So here we're loading from uh, the remote file server. We're going to load the functions that call from pause or to pause. The first one to come in is display link, which we've already seen. Here it's substituting the definition of from pause. Now it's substituting the definition of to pause. And now it tells me that it's unsaved the definition of display link, which used to be compiled code. And it now tells me that that's in fact all the functions that call from pause or to pause because it didn't proceed to do anything else. If I now redo the command that showed me the calling structure of the tree by asking the programmer's assistant to redo the command that has show in it, if we move down to the browsing window below, you'll see that after a moment's hesitation to recompute the calling relationships, you'll find that underneath display link there's no longer anything else. And the reason for that is that if we button up display link and go back to our browsing window on the right hand side, the new definition of display link has had the, the actual bodies of the functions from parse and to parse substituted in where those calls used to take place. You'll also notice that there was no longer a line printed at the top of the window saying that it was loading from phylum. And the reason for that is that this is now a local definition. And over the right hand side, the comment you can see there indicates the date and time of editing. And it, the system has been kind enough to attribute the editing to me, even though in fact it did it itself automatically. This is the first phase of the changes we want to make. But unfortunately, these record definitions are just as wrong as the original decomposition into functions. The system still thinks that the from pause and the to pause are a function of the nodes themselves directly. In reality, what these things really are is simply the top and the bottom. So what I'd like to do is to have the system rename these fields to reflect that fact, because the from and the to pause are going to be quite different things for me. To make this renaming, I'm going to go back to the teletype window and issue a command, which uses the system's knowledge of the files and the structures on them to do a systematic rename. The rename I have in mind is I want to rename node from pause to node bottom. I only want that rename to take place where node from pause is used as a field. I wouldn't want to rename a function of that name. And I only want this to take place on the, f on the file lattice. I don't know how many other uses of that name there may be elsewhere in the system. OK, you can now see the system has begun to do that. It's editing a function called set layout position, which uses one of those thing uses node from pause as a field. It has to load that from phylum. It's done that. It's now moving on to the function from pause, which we ad don't actually care about anymore since we've removed the only call to it. But the system doesn't know that yet. It fixed display link, which it did not have to load. And it went on to edit the record L node. L node was the record which actually contained the field node from pause. I didn't know that, but the system found it for me. It's also warning me that there's another function out there which uses L node, which has compiled code which is based on the old definition. I don't know whether I've managed to invalidate the old definition or not, but just to be safe, I'll follow the system's advice and I'll call unsaved funds, 
which will unsave the definition of node create by loading the symbolic definition from the file server so that the old compiled code won't be used anymore. That's one half of the rename. The other half of the rename is to rename node to parse to be uh, node top. I could retype that whole command back in again, but in fact it's so similar to the last one that I'll ask the system to fix the rename command that I used before. When I do that, the system presents me with the old version of the rename command and I can now go in and edit it on a character basis to give me the command I want. I begin by selecting the letters from in this. When I let the selection up, they were deleted and the system will now take some type in. I correct the type into two paws. This thing here that used to be node bottom, I select the bottom out. This should really be top. That's now the correct command. So I can now uh, tell the system to proceed by giving it the carriage return. And you'll see another rename taking place. It's editing the function set layout position. It's editing two paths, which it did not load in the last edit. It's editing other things, which it did load, unsaving the records again. And this time, there's nothing left for me to unsave because I already did it in the last pass through. I've now made the change in name. And if I go down into display link, Okay, into the browser, I can actually browse the definition of display link and I can see the modified version. Over on the right hand side you can see uh, the draw between now refers to names that have a better correspondence to the semantics that I have in mind. To edit this now to, to actually use those correctly, I'm going to use the display based editor of the system. I'm basically going to edit the function display link. When I do that, the system's giving me an expanding box again to, to use as a as a area for the editing to take place in. I'm now giving it such a box. I probably actually don't want it to obscure the TypeScript window because that tends to be bought up fairly frequently. But I don't mind if it obscures other things. When I give it the window, the definition of display link is pretty printed in there. And a menu on, appears on the left hand side of active edit commands, which I can select. Uh, but unlike pop up menus, they don't go away. It's there all the time. This display based editor is, in fact, a structured editor. It's not a character oriented editor the way the editor that I used on the rename function was. In that respect, it's very similar to the symbolic editor that we, is in Interlisp D, in the Interlisp 10 on the large time sharing systems. In this editor, I can select elements of structure, but not elements by characters. So I can go in here and, and select that particular piece of structure with the mouse. And you can see that when I did that, the uh, element was underlined to indicate that that's the current selection. When I move to uh, another element, the first element uh, becomes underlined with a different pattern that tells me it's selected as a secondary selection. I can also select, instead of just single elements, I can select uh, whole structures by selecting uh, an element with a slightly different uh, mouse button. And when I selected the draw between, you saw it picked up the entire structure, which it's a part. Now, this particular function doesn't have the right top-level structure for me, because the top-level structure I want is a conditional which is sensitive to the relative positions of the two nodes. So to begin to put that structure in, I'm going to type in the conditional that I'm going to want to make the top level. And as soon as I touch the keyboard, you can see a little type in window opened up and positioned itself uh, into which my keystrokes are going to be collected. The particular keystrokes I want is a conditional that says if the uh, from node is above the to node, then it's basically OK else it's basically not OK. That's the structure that I'm you know, going to have this, this program take. If we now go up to the top editing window, um, I, you can see that the draw between is now a secondary selection. If I'm going to go over to the left now and select in the edit operations, I'm going to insert the type in that I just made after the draw between. Now, this is, in fact, the top level structure. The arms of the conditionals that I used these little placeholders for, I now want to replace with 
the draw between command, which is a pretty good approximation to what I'm eventually going to want. So I select the appropriate things. I'm now substituting the draw between in place of that token. You can see that as I do that, it re-pretty prints the structure and keeps on propagating the re-pretty printing until the, st the structure stabilizes. I now select the other arm of the conditional and uh, I can basically make the same change. And now I have the two arms of the conditional set correctly. I now have no longer any need for this original piece of structure which I'm now going to throw away. There are many other ways I could have done that particular set of uh, commands. Now I have the top level structure correct, but still I have the same piece of code being executed in both conditions. So what I'm going to do now is basically in the condition where the from node is not above the top node, I really want these two fields to be interchanged. So I'm going to select both of them and then use the switch command to actually just exchange the two field definitions. That's actually going to do the right thing. The only problem I have left now is that, in fact, the function above that I used here really doesn't take nodes as its arguments. It takes positions, and it takes the same kinds of positions as draw between. So I'm now going to substitute in here for the actual position arguments. In this case, I'll take the, uh, the node top of the, f of the from node and replace that in there. And then for the other argument to above, I'll take the node top of the two node, which I can find already sitting in the definition. And now I have a definition of display link, which is more in accordance with what I had in mind. I now indicate to the system that I'm finished with this editing by hitting the OK command in the left-hand side um, in the menu. When I hit that, the edit menu disappears, indicating that I'm out of the editor. And I've now made the change that I wanted to make. You may have noticed just then, uh, as it happened several times earlier on during the demonstration, that the cursor inverted momentarily then to be a black, white on black rather than black on white. That inversion signals that garbage collection is taking place. The ELSP-D system uses an incremental garbage collector so that even though there's a very large amount of address space and lots of structure here, the garbage collection went by so quickly that it's hardly worth even bothering to tell the user about it, except simply by flashing the cursor at him. Now I think I've basically got the definition that I want, so I'm now going to go back and redo the previous uh, invocation of edit tree by asking the system to redo the last command that has the word parse in it. Uh, the system will find that command and will on the right hand side now be opening up uh, an edit tree window, the same window that we worked in before. And here you can see appearing the tree, the same tree of course, and now I'm back in the edit tree program with a slightly def different definition of display link. The same basic facilities work as before. Now I pick up the VP node, the test case for our modification is coming up. And you see now that when I lift the VP above the uh, VP bar, the link now is being drawn from the top of VP bar to the bottom of VP instead of the other way around. And that's a much more graphically pleasing image than what I had before. I now inclined to think that I've finished and successfully made the modification I want. Over in the left-hand side of the, of, the wind, of, the, of the screen now, uh, I'm going to ask the system what's been changed. And you'll see that the system knows that after the sequence of edits I've made, that the only file that needs to be dumped is the lattice, that all the changes I've made come from that file. Were I to type cleanup now, that file would be uh, remade symbolically and then recompiled and listed and so forth if I want. As it happens at this stage, I've finished all the work I want to do, so I'm going to leave the system to be uh, quietly amuse itself until I'm ready to work with it again.